inequality and social mobility. Is Dharman's moving escalator just a myth? I think this is the first, um, first dialogue or seminar that we are having, which has a question. You know, I think we decided to move. We decided to uh, make it as a question because uh, many people are not so sure. What is this moving escalator about? You know, and uh, and so it is very important for us, you know, to answer this question. We have to look at social mobility and why is it so important and how it is tied to the Singapore dream. So, keeping the Singapore dream alive. Now, what is so the first question that I would like to start by is asking, what is social mobility and why is it so important? Social mobility is the ability to move up and down an income ladder in one's lifetime and across generations. So having an understanding of social mobility is having an understanding of the status of the Singapore dream. So then you may ask, what then is the Singapore dream? The Singapore dream is simply a belief that whoever you are and wherever you come from, this is your land of opportunity. This is where you can achieve your personal and family dreams and pursue a life of meaning and purpose. So to understand, uh, to understand social mobility or uh, the escalator for that matter, you know, it, it, there's one video that I would like you to watch. It's a three minutes video. Uh, it'll give, it, it, the video is premised on the American society, but there are lots of similarities between the American society and the Singaporean society. So the video, please. Economic mobility is the ability to move up and down the income ladder during one's lifetime and across generations. So having an understanding of economic mobility is therefore having an understanding of the health and status of the American dream. There are two ways of measuring economic mobility. The first is absolute, which looks at upward and downward changes in income over time. When we look at absolute mobility in the United States, we see a glass that is half full. This is because the vast majority of Americans have higher incomes and inflation-adjusted dollars than their parents did at the same age, and that's true across the income distribution. In terms of absolute mobility, the American dream is doing quite well. The second measure of economic mobility is relative, which is concerned with a person's rank within the income distribution as a whole. By this measure, we see a glass half empty, because many Americans, especially those at the top and bottom of the income ladder, are unlikely to experience relative mobility. Of those whose parents were in the bottom fifth of the income distribution, about 40% remain in the bottom themselves as adults. Similarly, of those whose parents were in the top fifth of the income distribution, about 40% remain in the top themselves. And we call this phenomenon stickiness at the ends, because those at the ends of the income distribution are stuck there across generations. By this measure of mobility, the American dream is struggling. So what this means is that a person can experience upward absolute mobility, having more income, but not upward relative mobility, not moving out of the bottom. For example, if a family grows richer over time, but at a slower rate than many other families, they can experience upward absolute mobility at the same time they experience downward relative mobility. This is kind of like an escalator. If everyone is moving up, everyone experiences upward absolute mobility. But if people don't change positions on the escalator as it's moving, those who began at the bottom remain at the bottom even as they grow richer. Now imagine a second escalator. People are moving up, experiencing upward absolute mobility. A person gets on at the bottom and begins walking up the stairs, passing people on the escalator ahead of him. He is experiencing upward absolute mobility and upward relative mobility. Pew's Economic Mobility Project thus believes that both measures of mobility, absolute and relative, are important for having a complete picture of economic mobility in America. Neither perspective should be taken in isolation from the other. The project has identified a series of factors, including education, savings, and neighborhood poverty, that influence economic mobility. 
To learn more about these indicators and to read our reports, visit economicmobility.org. So after having watched this video, we have to ask ourselves, what is the health and status of the Singapore dream? Singapore's inequality story is very similar to the US's. Singapore is up there with the US, and, some, and by some measure, the UK as the most unequal societies. When we look at absolute mobility, we can say that the Singapore dream is well. This is because with broad-based income growth in the past decades, people were able to move up and down the income ladder. But if relative mobility is the measure, it will be quite another story. Only 14% of those with parents who were in the lowest income quintile when they were growing up managed to move up to the top quintile of income earners by their early 30s. And we looked at the term of stickiness at the ends, right? This is a chart from the World Inequality Database. It shows us that the shares of national income claimed by the top 1% and 10% of income earners amounted to 14% and 46% respectively in 2014. It tracks, uh, it tracks up to 2020 and then the chart you look, it drops off. Right, it doesn't drop off drastically. But it drops off. It's largely because of COVID-19. So uh, the charts suggest that COVID-19 was a great equalizer. I'm sure. I'm sure the professor will have a bit more to add on that. Right. The broken elevator versus the moving elevator. Sorry, the broken elevator versus the versus the moving escalator. In June 2018, the OECD published a new report on social mobility, suggesting that the elevator of social mobility may be broken and that unless it is fixed, there are high risk of downward mobility and loss of social status tend to reduce life satisfaction and undermine individual self-esteem, social cohesion and people's feeling that their voice counts particularly among middle and, income, middle and lower income people. In 2018, speaking at an IPS event, Mr. Dharman first brought up the idea of moving escalator to describe social mobility. He said that in Singapore, the escalator had to be kept moving to prevent a pervasive anxiety from forming among the people who are in the middle. Professor Paul Tambaya, who was also there at the event, highlighted the gaps in the lifespans of people from different ethnic groups in Singapore. He asked Mr. Tarman if more needs to be done about the structural factors that led to such form of inequality where those from lower income groups die at younger age than those from higher income ones. Mr. Tarman replied to uh, Dr. Tambaya, and said to him that a variety of factors, including lifestyles and diets, lead to shorter lifespans and not income levels per se. But how do you have better lifestyles and diets without better incomes, right? So if you look at the, at the, um, at the diagram that is before you, you see, you, uh, so after Mr. Dharman made that comment, this uh, Facebook group called MediaCorp, they came out with this uh, a meme which suggests that uh, the people at the top of the escalator, they have everything, you know, but the people who are starting at the bottom or right at the middle, they're so tired, and some of them are like, just like falling off the cliff, you know, and they made a comment. Tarman CB Smart. Well, you can read it there for yourself. So the next question to ask is, are people in the middle feeling the heat? Mr. Darwin was right about one thing, a pervasive anxiety felt by the middle income. Mr. Darwin knows this, and according to him, every $1 that a middle income family pays in tax, 
whether directly or indirectly, they get back at least $2 in subsidies in education, healthcare, and retirement. He compared it with Finland, where the return on their tax is around $1.30. This makes it seem that Singaporeans get a better deal. But unlike Finland, Singapore is a popular destination for expats. This increases competition for jobs and depresses salaries as companies prefer to hire foreigners. An OCBC survey done in the year 2020 showed that two in three working Singaporeans do not have savings to last them beyond six months. In December last year, the Monetary Authority of Singapore warned of rising debts among Singaporean households. In August this year, the Minister of Finance acknowledged that compared with the top 10 advanced economies by GDP per capita, the debt-to-income ratio of the household sector in Singapore, with the exception of the United States, is the lowest. Many Singaporeans are feeling anxious about unfair competition of jobs with foreigners, which impacts their salaries, promotions, respect they get at the workplaces, and statuses. And such anxiety is not unfounded. In 2018, a survey conducted by the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and Ong Teng Chong Labor Leadership Institute showed worrying statistics of seriously underemployed Singaporean graduates. And with surveys showing two in three Singaporeans dread going to work daily, we have to ask ourselves if the escalator of social mobility is out of order in Singapore. The erosion of the middle class. Singapore is a middle class society where an estimated 70% of Singaporeans consider themselves to be middle class. But with the influx of 1.64 million workers, many of them from poorer PMETs from India and Philippines who ended up in finance, computer and multinational corporations, they are easing out the locals. The arrival of this small army of hungrier foreign PMETs who are always ready to accept lower wages has impacted the incomes of locals significantly. The government has responded to the government has responded to public pressure by reducing the number of approvals given out, but the demographic infusion is still continuing. This infusion over the past 20 years has eroded bit by bit the Singapore middle class which is already hit by economic changes. The danger of collapse of the middle class. Jeanette just reminded me that I just have uh, five more minutes for my, for my sharing, but I have, uh, maybe I'll take three more minutes from there because I shared you a video of three minutes, right? So, <laughs> so if, you com if you compare two types of income, the capital income and the labor income, Capital income is rising quickly while labour or earned income is stagnant. If left unchecked, this might likely contribute to an M-shaped society where there is a collapse of the middle class. Well, I will say that the middle class must be preserved to save our republic. The problem of economic inequality is an age-old problem and is not new. Kings, statesmen, philosophers have always been deeply worried about the problem of economic inequality. They are worried that either the rich would oppress the poor or the poor would seek to, to confiscate the wealth of the rich. And the result would be violence, instability and even revolution. Throughout history, government used, governments used various methods to create stability and to build inequality into their governing systems such as having different bodies of government representing different economic classes. For example, in ancient Rome, there was a patrician senate for the wealthy and the tribune of the plebs for the commoners. And in the UK, you have a two-house system, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. But Singapore does not have any of these features because the founding of modern Singapore was on, was on relatively equal economic grounds which is why it did not have designs the constitution that other society had to check the powers of the rich and the poor to prevent instability. With no feudalism, no hereditary aristocracy, 
and with property being the primary form of wealth for 90% of the population, our constitution was built on the basis of relative economic equality. So, the fight to rebuild the middle class is not, is not for economic growth or on moral grounds, but it, but it is something that is constitutionally necessary to save our republic. To have a republic, we need to have a society where the distribution of wealth is relatively egalitarian. Without this, we will have an oligarchy or ochlocracy or mob rule. And those are the kind of society that we do not want. Some examples of an oligarchy and ochlocracy are Iran and uh, uh, well, some even say China. No, but. Uh, so this is the challenge. Our republic and our constitution are all built on more egalitarian values, without which our society would collapse. But the economic conditions have changed. We now live in a world where there is increasing inequality, and a greater and greater share of our country's wealth goes to the 1% and the 0.1% of the people. And what that means is the wealthiest people in Singapore are able to convert their economic power into political power, they have more influence in, in the government, and that influence means that the kind of policies the government takes on tend to support these people. And this is the problem because the government is not going to be as representative as it should be. So we believe that, that the government needs to urgently realign with the middle class. In benchmarking their salaries to the 60% of median income of the top 1,000 earners who are citizens, the government ministers have chosen to identify themselves with the 1% or the 0.1%. Because their wages are packed to the top earners, they have every incentive to ensure that their salaries of this group of earners remain high and continue to increase, while they have very little incentive to grow the incomes of all Singaporeans. Which is why during the last GE, RDU called on them to refocus on growing the wages of Singaporeans. Globalization aggravates inequality and one measure used to track this is the share of wages in national income. Despite having one of the highest GDP per capita in the world, our wage share of GDP is around 43%, lower than that of most developed economies, which is 50% or more. This may even mean that the workers in Singapore are underpaid and raises questions of if Singapore's economic growth has disproportionately benefited multinational companies and capital owners at the expense of workers. Wage distribution policies are also skewed towards educated top earners. RDU proposed that to incentivize the government and to protect the middle class and to grow the wage shares in Singapore to match that of other first world countries. Ministerial salaries should be packed to the multiples of median gross salary income from work. Public option, the solution to inequalities. So what is public option? Singaporeans love public option and have relied on them for decades. We just don't usually think of them with that label. A public swimming pool is a public option. Many people have private swimming pools. A public library is a public option. Many universities have private libraries. Public parks, public schools, and now public defenders in courtrooms. The list goes on. They are all public options. Government provisions of goods and services that coexist with the, with the private marketplace. Throughout our history, Singapore has turned to public options as a way to promote equal opportunity and reconcile markets with democracy. Public options also benefit competitive markets and make capitalism work. It acts as a check on monopoly power in concentrated sectors. The idea that public options and markets are incompatible is simply false. We don't have to choose between competitive markets and equal opportunity. So there is a need to challenge the recent wisdom about the proper role of government. So today, RDU is making a policy proposal to study, to ask the government to study if public options may be expanded. There are three areas especially where it can be reviewed if public options may be expanded. Number one, 
public options for basic accounts run through postal service. We used to have the post office savings bank, which offered, which offered with no fees, no maxim, no minimums, no frills, basic savings account. This was until POSB was absorbed by DBS and post office was privatized. The recent Sports Hub saga shows us that public-private partnerships don't always give the best outcomes. A public option like this will especially be useful to senior citizens who are working, who are not working or have very little income from work. They do not have to give the bank a small amount of money every month if their savings fall below a certain amount. Low cost, number two, low cost, high, high quality options for childcare. Childcare in Singapore can cost between $1,250 to $1,400 in anchor-operated childcare centres. And of course, there are subsidies which will dent the cost of childcare, but the large ch chunk of additional subsidy is tied to the, to the mother and if she's working or not. A low-cost option in childcare will do wonders to up our total fertility rate. Broadband internet coverage. Out of the households living in one- and two-room HDB flats, 45% have access to internet. Zero minutes, plus, but please give me two minutes. Thank you. Uh, have zero access to uh, internet. So this option will especially benefit the low-income families who live in public rental flats. We cannot afford a digital divide. Public option reveals smart ways to meet pressing public needs while spurring healthy competition and more effectiveness than vouchers or tax credits. We don't have to choose between competitive and equal markets. Public options are a way to mitigate the damage which comes from the worst aspects of capitalism while creating a common fabric that ties us together. Public options could offer us all fairer choices, fairer choices and greater security. So coming back again to the question, is Dharma's moving escalator just a myth? If by referring to a moving escalator, Dharma means to say that he wants everyone to move up and not get left behind then that is a laudable objective and must be supported. But if it means everyone getting into the same moving escalator that is moving upwards, then that is questionable. You know, where I live, you know, there's a mall that people get to. If you come from one direction, you have to go up from the first floor. If you come from another direction, you take the escalator, it goes right up to the second floor. You know, so imagine if there's a sale happening on the second floor, if you're coming from another direction, you'll be the first to access, uh, access that sale, right? And as a friend said, the reality, is the, the reality is that some are going on a faster escalator that is moving up to lofty heights, while others are on different slow-moving escalator that may not even be moving at all. If that description is true, then Dharma's moving escalator is definitely just a myth. Thank you.